Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd likes to film stuff, and I just got back from the AT&T store picking up the BlackBerry Priv, which is now available. I am really curious about this device, and I know a lot of you are curious as well. You may not want to go out and buy it, but hey, I know that there's some curiosity about this. This is BlackBerry's very first Android phone. I've been toying around with quite a few BlackBerry phones. I toyed around with a BlackBerry Passport last year and did a BlackBerry Challenge. That was a lot of fun. I was actually able to get Google services working on that phone, although everything wasn't entirely working properly like an Android phone, so this really caught my attention when this was announced. Plus, we've got that keyboard on here, so let's just go ahead and open the box. So at at and I paid a little over $800, I think, in total for this phone. That is because Washington state tax is like 10% almost. And also, this device was more expensive than on the website. On the website, BlackBerry's website, it's $700, $699. So if you go and pick it up at AT&T, you're going to be paying more for it, unfortunately. Now this is a big box. I'm curious to see what we get in this box. Let's just go ahead. Come on, you know you want to open for me. Yes, yes. Come on. Yeah. All right, so there you have your classic, it can wait, texting and driving screen protector. Huh, that's not too heavy. Let's just go ahead and set that aside for a second. So we've got the documentation, blah, blah, blah. Just kind of tossing aside. This kind of looks like standard Blackberry Fair opening the box. Nice presentation, although ruined by AT&T's orange. Looks like you've got the SIM ejection tool here. Got other bits of documentation, safety and product information. You've got your official Qualcomm certificate. This is the Snapdragon 808 SoC that is inside of this device. So they did not opt for the 810. So here we have our little charging brick. This looks like a 1.3 amp charger. Looks like we've got some headphones, earphones. That's nice because a lot of the times I've seen with AT&T that they don't include things in the box. So you do get some earbuds, so that's nice. And we've also got just our standard sync cable. This micro USB. Anything under there? Nope, that's just packaging. All right, so you know, standard fare in the box. Let's go ahead and set that aside, get to the phone. So the battery is locked in here. So this is telling us where we have our SD card slot and also the SIM tray as well. So this is 32 gigabytes of internal storage and also nice, we also have expansion. Just pull that off. We've got our camera here, 18 megapixel camera. I'm curious to go and take some images. This has got optical image stabilization. We've also got a dual tone flash. Now, as I mentioned, the battery is locked in here, 3,410 milliamp hours. So that's a pretty nice sized battery. Curious to see how that stands up. Ooh, I really like this rubbery feel of the back. Mm. That is not slippery, not slippery in the slightest. So here we have a speaker grill that's along the bottom there. We've got our micro USB charging port, headphone jack. It's got a soft touch feeling all over the place. I wonder if this is shoved in my pocket so many times or key scratched this, if this coating is going to come off. That's kind of my very, very first thought. So just pulling that off. Looks like we've got the power button here on the side. You've also got your volume rockers and your BlackBerry Assistant button. Let's go ahead and turn it on. So what I want to do with this is to take some notes as I am discovering things. Just want to use it for a few hours and give you the best cutting edge first impressions that I possibly can of this phone, the things that really stick out to me. Of course, we have the keyboard. Now, I like physical keyboards. That's something that I really do enjoy, so I'm excited. This does function as a trackpad as well. I really, really enjoyed the keyboard that was on the BlackBerry Passport. So finally, we have an Android phone that looks nice and slim like this, but we've also got an excellent keyboard, and who better to make a keyboard than BlackBerry? Ooh, just starting up the phone, and I'm noticing that it's getting a little warm. I've been hearing a few people say that just how hot this device gets upon normal usage, so I'm going to be really curious to see how this ends up performing. Come on, start up. Tired of waiting. 
And we're back. Actually, this is the next day that I'm sitting here with this. So I said I wanted to talk about the things that really stood out to me here. So Quick Charge 2.0, this does have Quick Charge 2.0. It just doesn't come with a Quick Charge 2.0 charger. So that's something that's going to come at an extra expense for you. But that's just some food for thought here. This is a large battery and it can charge quickly with a Quick Charger. Another thing that really stood out to me was this button here. So we've got this button and you press it and it just doesn't seem to do anything. But when you turn it on and you press it, you can see it brings up the volume selection here, but so do the volume buttons. So it took me some time. I was like, what in the world does this button do? I thought this was for Blackberry Assistant. It's not for Blackberry Assistant. So let's just pick a random video. Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd likes to build stuff. If you push it now, it actually mutes. That's what it does. It's a mute button. So that's interesting, I guess. It would be really nice if this button was reprogrammable, but it just doesn't seem to be so, so far from what I have seen. The next thing that sticks out to me is this display, 5.4 inches, quad HD display, really high pixel density, and this thing gets really, really bright. So I've been really happy with how bright this display gets. And also what's really nice is that you can go underneath display here and here you have the option for color adjust. I really wish that other OEMs included this. This is really nice. So not only can you choose how warm or cool you want the display to be. So here it's really, really warm. Or if you like a more cool tone, you're free to adjust that. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice here. You can keep it in the middle, which is the default. And also you can adjust the saturation. So you can go from subdued to really vibrant. You have control over that. I have a feeling that this isn't calibrated the best. I'm just taking a look at the CIE diagram here and I see some weird deviation in the colors. All right, so I've had a chance to take a look at the measurements of the calibration just with it being at the default. Yes, this display does get nice and bright. 450 nits, that's pretty great. Also, it does have a great contrast ratio because this is an AMOLED display, so you get nice inky blacks. Also, I really appreciate that you can control those sliders between making it look really saturated or not, and also warm or cool. But unfortunately, even when I messed around with those sliders, I couldn't get it to look like any type of calibration standard, specifically RGB. Interestingly, no matter what I did, there was just always too much red saturation. Also, no matter what I did with adjusting cool to warm, there was just too much green in the balance of red, green, and blue, so the display kind of looks a little bit greenish to me. Now, there are some other things with the calibration that I would like to talk about, but I will reserve those for later on. I'm just talking about right now the things that really stood out to me. Overall, this display is not calibrated the best. It is not a horrible display, but it definitely could be better with the calibration. However, I don't think that many people are going to be complaining. So now I'd like to take a second to thank WhisperSync for Voice and Amazon and Audible Innovation for making content creation possible and also specifically for making purchasing this device possible for this review. As you guys know, these devices are not cheap. So a lot of you guys know that I love my Audible books and my Kindle books. If you don't know what WhisperSync is though, it's essentially where you purchase your Kindle book or if you have your Kindle book already, you're able to purchase the audio companion that goes along with it. Then inside of the Kindle application, you're able to switch easily between reading and the audio. It picks up in the exact same place. So I can show you how this works. We can go ahead and open it. So here is my book, The Hunger Games, for example. And so here I'm in reading mode and just say that I got up in the morning and I'm reading and now I'm going to work in the car and I can't read anymore, obviously. So I can say switch to listening and it picks up. Is a dark brown. My head is aching. It picks up right in the spot that I was first reading. So I can say switch back to the reading mode and you can see that it has it highlighted here just where I left off. So that's really cool, really useful. For people who really like to read but just don't feel like they have enough time, you're able to upgrade your books. So just say that you already purchased that Hunger Games book, you can go and upgrade the book or when you go to purchase the book itself, you can add this onto it. It's $2.99 for this particular example. It's nice because it's affordable. They don't charge you an arm and a leg to upgrade or even to add this narration onto the book that you buy. There's over 60,000 Kindle bestsellers and popular titles right now that you can upgrade or purchase a book with. 
So this is called WhisperSync for voice. If you're curious to try this out, follow amazon.com slash Erica. So again, if you guys are curious about this and you want to learn how to add narration to your Kindle eBooks, just visit amazon.com slash Erica and you guys can try it out. So let me know what you think about this. This is something that I particularly enjoy. The next thing I noticed, of course, is this keyboard. Now on the BlackBerry Passport, this seems really familiar to the BlackBerry Passport keyboard. There were some nice things that you could do to get the keyboard to work as a trackpad. So if you double tap here, you can get this cursor to come up and then you can slide back and forth kind of to pick where you need the cursor to be. So you can do your editing or whatever. Double tap again, makes it disappear. I can go back like this really fast and it's going to be acting as a backspace. There you go. So I really do like some of the cool things that you can do with this. I really like where I can program as shortcut keys. So if I hold down on the T, actually you need to get out of the program that you're in to the home screen. And if you hold down on the T now, it's going to pull up Twitter. I kind of wish that that worked inside of any application. Also with this keyboard, if you hold down the shift key and you drag, you see you can make a selection. You can also slide downward like this and it's going to bring up your symbol pad. This also brings up the number pad. Now as you are typing, you can see that we are given some suggestions. You're free to just touch like that, or you can swipe towards the word that you see there. So if I want if as the next suggestion, I can go ahead and swipe like so. You can see it's just adding this particular one here. Just say if I want the one that's here though, I can swipe upward and it will complete it for me. So it's flicking these onto the screen, if you will. So up, of, you, that works really nice. Now you can also use the keyboard to scroll. So here we are inside of Chrome. This doesn't work on everything, but it does work in a few places. Also works on the home screen. So you can go between your different panels. So the idea is that the keyboard is supposed to be very fully interactive and make you more productive, BlackBerry claims. I think that the feeling is nice. The keys are not as hard to press as the BlackBerry Passports were, but they do have a nice feedback still. I am happy to see when typing on the keyboard that it isn't top heavy. So I can comfortably sit here and type without worrying about this being really heavy at the top and becoming really cumbersome on my wrists. So that might be a question some people have. That's just to let you know. I feel that this phone is for someone who absolutely needs a keyboard. But to be honest though, I'm really fast now with on-screen keyboards. I like physical keyboards, but I see that I'm actually faster with just the on-screen keys. Our text autocorrection and predictive text is very, very accurate and good these days. So I'm actually trying to relearn how to use a keyboard in a way that doesn't make it feel kind of deliberate and slow to me. The keyboard that BlackBerry has on here is not bad either. Hello there, how are you? And that's actually pretty accurate. You can see that you can flick also little suggestions that pop up and I find this to be useful. So either way you do this using the keyboard that they provided here or their on-screen keyboard, they both do really well. The next thing that sticks out is the BlackBerry launcher. It's very simple. It does look quite like stock Android, although they do add a couple of things here. This ends up looking a little bit redundant. So if I click on this one here, here's my YouTube notification. This one brings up some settings. This is talking about a notification within Lollipop. But when you pull downward, you have access to all that anyway. So this doesn't really make much sense to me. I do like how with the icon here, you can just flick upward to say on this and you are brought to a widget, so even with Twitter, you flick upward and it brings the Twitter widget. This kind of reminds me of what we have on the iPhone 6S with the 3D touch. Instead of holding downward to take a peek at what's going on, you can flip upward here and you can get access to that widget. So I think that's nice. Now, if you hold down here, you can see that we have options for icon packs. So within this launcher, you can change the icons. That's a nice touch. So they are aiming at some customizability here. Oh, that's very clean. 
We've also got the productivity tab, which people are likening to kind of what's on the S6 Edge. So if this is enabled, you're going to have a little tab here on the side. And here you can get to new notifications. So things for calendar, you can look at my unread messages and my inboxes, my tasks for today and contacts, favorites. So if you don't have a need for this, you can just get rid of it. And now it's gone. Now, if you just like the keyboard and you really don't care for any of BlackBerry's features at all, you can just download the Google Now Launcher. So there you have it, looking very googly. Now, if you really, really have a seething hatred for any BlackBerry features and just want the keyboard, you can just go in underneath the app tray and start disabling all BlackBerry stuff as well. And just disable everything, and it just really starts to look like a plain old Android phone. Otherwise, right here, if you pull upward, you have access to default, the BlackBerry Hub. So under here, you can have access to all of your accounts, email addresses, things like Twitter. Just kind of hiding my email addresses. Don't care if you guys see this one. This is my YouTube one. And here you are. You have everything, every notification that you could possibly want to look at. I'm trying to really get into the BlackBerry feel, and I have disabled sync for Gmail so that I can use BlackBerry Hub. Right now, I kind of like it. I kind of liked how it was on the BlackBerry Passport better or when it was full BlackBerry because I liked kind of peeking into the hub and seeing what was going on and just going right back out of it. You can't do that on here. So I kind of miss that. I kind of miss that BlackBerry-ness of it. What's really nice about using BlackBerry's email application is that you can snooze a notification. So here's a Twitter message or Twitter email. I can snooze it. And it's going to bring up how long I want to snooze it. So for 30 minutes, 3 hours, 6 hours tomorrow, I can pick a time. I want it to bring it up again. I can decide for it to alert me when I walk through the door at home by location or work. Or even to a certain network, certain Wi-Fi network, for example. So add connection. I can choose my certain Wi-Fi connection. So I am finding that to be quite cool because there's a lot of times where somebody emails me and I forget. I even star it. I even put it as a priority to go back to it, and I still forget. So if someone like me is reminded, it makes it easier for me to go and respond to whoever that person is. Now, performance-wise, I notice that this phone always runs a little bit warm. No matter what I am doing, this phone feels a little bit warm. There isn't really any time that I've noticed that this phone feels cool to the touch, unless it's off, of course. I'm not exactly sure why that is. I've got plenty of Android phones right now that have the Snapdragon 808 SoC inside of them and they stay nice and cool for the most part. Unless you are really, really taxing it or doing a lot of things, web browsing on LTE, those types of things, gameplay. But this is just warm for no reason sometimes. I've never noticed it gets swelteringly hot though. Even after running some benchmarks, I do feel that it feels warm to the touch quite a bit, but not ever something that's too toasty where I really don't feel like I should pick this up or hold it. Now granted, I do live in Washington and the weather is quite cool here, so I wonder what this would be like in warmer climates. This would probably be a phone that's quite uncomfortable to hold or use all day long. Although here right now during the winter, I have to admit that it's quite nice. It's kind of like my toasty hand warmer for now. That should not be a feature. I hope this is just some software issue. Not exactly sure what's going on here. But just keep in mind that for right now, this does feel warm to the touch all the time. Now, in terms of performance around the interface, just with BlackBerry's launcher, I wouldn't call it the most absolute smoothest that I have seen. I really prefer Google's own launcher, but it's really not bad. The interesting thing though, when I compare the performance of just say something like the Moto X Pure with this, I noticed that in benchmarks, that the Moto X Pure scores a bit better than this device. I'm not sure what's going on. I know this is BlackBerry's first Android phone. Not sure how they have things optimized, but I find that applications open more quickly on this one. Let's just pick something like Twitter. So there you go. Something like YouTube. That's done, now that's done. So just a tad bit behind is what I see. We can open up a large application like Riptide GP2. So this is already done loading. 
So just a hair behind, really. So here we have Geek Bench. Now here we have our Geek Bench score, looking at single core and multi core scores. I've done this you know, over and over again, and we do consistently see that this score is behind the Moto X Pure. Now here we have GFX benchmark testing GPU performance. You can see with Manhattan on screen, 7.4 versus 9.3 frames per second. We've got 12 versus 15, 18 versus 24, and 26 versus 34. So we are having a difference across the board between CPU and GPU scores, and I do notice it in gameplay. So far I've been playing a few games just to see how the performance is, and I think that it plays all right. Although I do sense that I get a bit better frame rates on the Moto X Pure, especially when I jacked up the settings all the way on Riptide GP2. Even though the frame rates were not good on the Moto X Pure, they still seem to be worse on this one. I'm going to take more time playing around with this, but I'm curious to see how this is going to be performing overall. This has just been released, so I don't want to say too much about performance currently. It is satisfactory, but this is not the best performer of all the Android phones I've played with, and certainly not of the S808 SoCs. I'm going to have to hold off right now for talking about battery life because this is still really just on its first or second cycle of using the battery. But right now my impression is that the battery life is just kind of average. Again, really hang tight for that before I make a full statement about battery life. Now, as for the camera, I really don't want to say too much about it just yet. I want to have a chance to go out and take some pictures, except for it's been raining all day today, so there's been absolutely no sun. Some people were commenting on how this is not very fast of a camera. It's really not that slow though. I mean, if you've played with the BlackBerry Passport, you know what slow is for the camera. At least last I had played around with the Passport. You've got your HDR setting here. And HDR makes three clicks and you can't disable this sound from what I can see. So that is kind of annoying. But for video resolutions, you see we've got 1080p, you've got 1080p 60 frames per second, 4K video at 30 frames per second. So this does look like it's a fully loaded camera in terms of features. I noticed that you can only take 1 to 1 ratio pictures or 4.3, no 16.9. Photo quality is fine or standard. So for fine you have 18 megapixels. We don't really have any manual controls to speak of. We do have the exposure compensation right here though. We have some filters. You've got some modes, so video, photo, panorama. You can switch around to the 2 megapixel front facing camera. That's a really paltry resolution these days, especially for the price. Then you've got access to your gallery. So I'm going to take some time playing around with this. Yoshi! So, so far with what I can tell with this camera and some controlled lighting conditions that the colors look pretty nice. And we also get plenty of detail in good lighting. And now it doesn't quite have the dynamic range that the iPhone 6s has. That's just what I've been testing it against. And has some issues with its highlights as well. Also in less than perfect lighting I start to notice some noise creeping in. And in low light it really tends to become a noisy grainy mess. I can tell that this camera's strong suit is going to be out in perfect daylight, and I can only hope that BlackBerry continues to work on this camera, because I think that it has a lot of potential and great specs. Lastly, we have this speaker grill that's at the bottom here, and I'm glad that it's on the front, but it's really not an impressive sounding speaker. It kind of sounds a little flat to me. It does get loud enough, though. So this is really all that I want to say for now. My thoughts are that you really wouldn't particularly go for this phone unless you really needed the keyboard. And the keyboard is definitely a nice feature to have, although not a huge necessity because of just how good on-screen keyboards have become these days. Plus, I think that you can get a phone at a better price point with performance that's even a little bit better than what we get here. This is over 800 bucks for this. That's kind of crazy. For the price here. It should be $700 though, that's because I purchased this from AT&T. They do hike up the price and then tax. Of course, always tax. So I want to take some time to play around with this, see how I feel, if this is something that I would really end up using as a daily driver.
So please stay tuned for that. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Stay tuned and have a good night.